Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. So uh, just yesterday as I was driving home from a long weekend, which was very nice by the way, uh, I put up a Q&A post on my community page asking for questions for this uh, Q&A video. So uh, we have about 20 questions or so. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get through all of them. Uh, frankly, there's, there's quite a lot and um, some of them are really good questions that will probably uh, take up a couple of minutes to answer each. So um, we'll see how many we can get through. I've turned the camera on and we'll record for 20 minutes or so and kind of just see what we can get through. But without further ado, let's get straight into the questions. If you want to ask a question in a future video, uh, just keep an eye out for my community posts. I always um, ask for my Q&A video questions over on that page. So uh, let's get into the first question. And this is from Bob Ross and Bob actually has a few questions here. So uh, when did you start investing and what is your average annual return thus far? Will you ever collab with Monash Probri? Do you plan on ever going to any Berkshire annual meetings? What beard grooming tools do you use and uh, when are you going to drop the tutorial on beard trimming is there a way to contact you directly email ig etc bob that's a lot of questions but i'll see what i can do to get through these so um let's knock out the easy ones first so if if you do want to contact me directly my email address and instagram and twitter all of that's always in the in the bio or the description for these um, videos so um have a look down there and you'll be able to figure out how to get in touch with me uh beard grooming tools i'm not particularly sophisticated i have a little electric trimmer and then i kind of shave under my neck and down here to shape it up a bit. My sister's actually a hairdresser, so that also helps. Um, do you plan on ever going to any Berkshire annual meeting? So yeah, the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, I think is coming up this weekend, which I will certainly be doing a video summary on uh, kind of as quickly as I can after that meeting. Um, and I would love to go at some point. Obviously, um, we can't really do that with all the travel restrictions right now. The other thing is the trip to Omaha from New Zealand is massive. I, I've looked this up a couple of times before, uh, and it's probably like a 36 hour plus journey to actually get to Omaha. So I would love to do that at some point. And if I've got any US subscribers that want to make that journey and catch up as well, that would be fantastic to be able to, to do that. So uh, will I ever collab with Monash Pabra? I would love to. And uh, I guess your big question is when did you start investing and what is your average annual return thus far? So I invested or started investing in around 2017 sort of uh, only really a few months out of university so starting with very small sums and I guess in the grand scheme of things I'm probably still working with what you'd call small sums or at least a lot of you know large experienced investors would probably call it that uh, what is your average annual return thus far so that's a, an interesting question I haven't actually ever disclosed my annual returns uh, sort of year by year on this channel before I think I've mentioned some figures here and there on, on live streams and things but um, I'm yet to give a full sort of compound annual growth rate uh, answer to that question and there's a couple of reasons for that the big overarching one is that I don't think my track record is long enough to be meaningful you know I think a lot of people really don't talk about their returns and then maybe they'll come out and have a really good year and then they'll spray the, that you know recent annual return number everywhere in an effort to sell things and I don't want to be that person I've um, like I said only been investing since 2017 and I really only made my first what I would call sort of value investment in late 2018 so in terms of full years we've really only got 2019 and 2020 and I really don't think that's a long enough period of time to have a meaningful track record so um, those two years have been pretty good to me last year I beat the market substantially uh, the year before that I was actually slightly lagging the market but um, I just don't think it's long enough to, to be a meaningful track record for me to come out and share um, certainly if I was ever to uh, want to manage money at some point and you know I opened that up to the public then I would certainly publish a track record but um, you know maybe once I'm sort of three five years into this value investing journey I will feel as though that track record is a little bit more meaningful and maybe I'll share some returns on the channel. We'll, we'll have to see with that one. But uh, I appreciate your questions there, Bob. So next question is from Money with Marcus. Hey, Tom, I was wondering if you could briefly touch on how you split up your typical week in terms of allocating time to making YouTube videos, taking part in two podcasts, researching different companies for potential investment ideas or while working a full-time job. Uh, really enjoy all the content you've been putting out. Cheers. Uh, thanks for your question, Marcus. Uh, this is a bit of a constant battle for me. So in terms of YouTube, I try and release three videos a week. So trying to get on a more consistent schedule with releasing videos Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Um, those are all sort of New Zealand times, so it may be in and around the edges of that, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but that's kind of what I target. So in terms of YouTube, I actually pretty much film all my videos before work in the morning. So um, right now I'm recording a video, it's about 20 past seven in the morning. I'll 
film this, um, you know, get changed and then basically go to work. That's how I manage the YouTube video stuff. I basically just get up sort of an hour earlier and, and give myself some time to get prepared and then and put a YouTube video together. So that's what I do for that. Um, the podcast, I generally do like one evening after work or perhaps, you know, one day on the weekend. Um, and then we obviously have the weekly live streams with punch card investing as well. So that's sort of how I manage my time for producing content uh, in and around my full-time job. In terms of researching investment ideas, sometimes that's part of the YouTube research process and um, other times it's not. So frankly, that's probably the one that gets pushed down the list the, the easiest. I feel like I do have to be pretty consistent on YouTube and obviously have to go to work. Um, so that's probably the one that I do slack on, if any, if I don't have the, the time in a given week. Um, but each night I, I do try to make about 30 minutes available for general reading or um, researching investment ideas if possible. So um, that's the way that I sort of split up my time. So thanks for the question, Marcus. Okay, next question is from from Cam, which is uh, how are you going with the house hunting? Yeah, good question. So um, for anyone that doesn't know, I'm looking to purchase my first property this year. Um, not all by myself. I'm going to be doing that with my girlfriend and we'll be sort of splitting that 50-50. But um, that is something that we're looking to work through at the moment. The, there's a couple of challenges for us there. So um, one of the things we're also doing at the same time as looking for a house is, or as buying a house is actually probably moving regions. So uh, that makes it a bit of a challenge to go to open homes, you know, as frequently as you'd like to and that sort of stuff. So, um, I mean, in terms of the pre-approval, we're, um, you know, it's pretty smooth sailing through that. Um, one of the cool things is it looks like we're going to be able to buy about as much house as we would ever want without um, having to sell shares, which is fantastic. I can keep the portfolio going and um, not detract too much from that but certainly there's a good chunk of the portfolio here just sitting in cash at the moment in order to, to try and buy a house so um no major updates on that one just yet but i'll be i'll be sure to put that on youtube once um, something does happen there so thanks for your question cam uh isaac kenny with the big questions what's your favorite animal <laughs> probably uh, I reckon probably something like a New Zealand yellowtail kingfish would be my, my favorite animal. Um, I've gotten more and more into fishing over the past few years and that is um, certainly my favorite fish to catch. They are very strong fighters and will uh, tear your arms off if you uh, catch a large one of them. So that's always good fun. Um, next question is from Karan Ganani. What's been your most speculative investment so far? So. I really um, have not made many speculative investments at all. It's something I just try to avoid doing. So um, certainly early on when I was getting started investing and just buying shares in random companies and not really knowing what I was doing, um, that was speculation looking back at it. But, it, but since I've, I guess, developed a, a solid investment process, um, really the only speculative investment I've made is probably in the A2 Milk Company. So that is um, a very small percentage of my portfolio. It's not significant at all, but um, that is probably the most speculative investment I've made so far. And that is really speculative in terms of what I think the business results could be out into the future. I think there's probably still some margin of safety in the price that I bought it at. Um, it's just that the range of outcomes for that business are, are getting, I think, a little bit wider than they might have been viewed in, in the past, maybe a couple of years ago. And that inherently makes that investment a little bit more speculative. Um, but good thing is, I guess the price has come down a lot since it's all-time highs and I was able to purchase, you know, at, at um, relatively close to today's prices. So um, that's probably my most speculative investment so far. I've never bought a MJ stock or an electric vehicle stock or anything like that to um, really throw some speculation into the portfolio. So um, that's where we're at with that one. Uh, Jeremy B, how do you stay patient with investments? What was the biggest unforced error you've made with an investment? Um, yeah, staying patient. I guess um, one of the core parts of my framework is I'm really only trying to find one or two investment ideas per year, and that's sort of a goal that I set every single year. So um, that in and of itself kind of keeps me quite patient and stops me from just randomly buying into different stocks. It's very much like a punch card investing Warren Buffett style approach, which was sort of the inspiration for the name of a collaboration YouTube channel that I've got now called Punch Card Investing with a few other YouTubers where we do weekly live streams. Definitely check that one out. 
Um, so yeah, I guess in terms of staying patient, it's just, you know, me sticking to the process. I've set up rules that basically, you know, allow me to be patient naturally. So that's, uh, that's the way that I've done that. And in terms of my biggest unforced error, um, I guess I've had, I've really only had one ever permanent loss of capital and, uh, it's looking like one of the, or the topic for our live stream this week on punch card investing will be around mistakes. So, um, we'll, I will, I will get into more detail on that in the live stream, but I've really only ever had one, um, permanent loss of capital. I've had one investment that I was extremely close to pulling the trigger on and I really just need to give myself sort of an extra day to do some final, um, tidy up around the edges for the research and, uh, that stock ended up um, going up, I think, about 5x on me or 4x on me without um, me actually being able to get into that position. So um, that's probably my biggest mistake of omission, and that's my biggest mistake overall as well. So again, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, on this week's upcoming live stream. Okay, next question is from Bugalugs NZ1. Uh, do you or have you in the past invested in ETFs or managed funds other than through KiwiSaver? And if so, roughly what percentage is, was, uh, I guess what percentage is that of your share portfolio? So um, yeah, I have invested in um, one ETF before and that's the New Zealand Top 50 Fund, not a re recommendation or anything, that's just an investment I made uh, fairly early on. And I've basically made no change to that investment since making it in around 2017. So um, that has continued to have its dividends reinvested and I really haven't added to it at all. So to answer your question around what percentage of the portfolio it is, I think when I first made that investment, it was probably, oh, that's a bit of a guess. It was probably like 60% of the portfolio, but again, I was working with very small amounts of money. So that's really not a super relevant percentage because as I continued to contribute, that 60% went down and down and down quite quickly um, as kind of a you know percentage of the overall pie as I was making that pie larger by continuing to put money towards it. So uh, as of today, I would guess that that same uh, investment is probably something like maybe 4% of the portfolio or something. I've just continued to, to hold it. And it's again, become a smaller component of the portfolio as the rest of it has grown. So um, I don't see myself adding a bunch of ETFs to the portfolio unless I do get, you know, five or 10 years down the track and have a horrendous track record or something. Maybe I'll just stop value investing and, and start investing in ETFs. But um, I don't see myself doing that at this point, but um, my KiwiSaver is all indexed. And I know you mentioned outside of KiwiSaver, but I thought I'd, I'd throw that in there as well. So uh, Scotty Mac, what is your favorite part of the investment process? So I guess my favorite part of the process is sort of the thrill of the hunt and um, finding one of these 50 cent dollars, one of these businesses that's right in my circle of competence, meets all my criteria and is available at a really cheap price. That's something I get very, very excited about. Um, and that's my favorite part of the investing process without a doubt is finding one of those because they don't come up very often. And typically if you can find one of those, you sort of make a lot of money just when you buy. If you can buy a good business at the right price that doesn't mean it's going to go up tomorrow but over the you know next few years it should do quite well assuming that you're correct on your analysis so thank you for your question there our next question is from Lachlan Jessen uh, what stocks are on your watch list uh, I think this is a topic I might do a full video on so I can show you everything that's on my watch list I will say it's not particularly exciting because I will put a stock on my watch list where it is when it's nowhere near a price that I would buy it. So uh, I guess there's a few core criteria I'm looking at. Uh, is the business I can understand? Does it have a moat? Does it have a good management team? And then sort of the final criteria is that price or margin of safety. So I will put on a stock on the watch list if it meets the first three and it's nowhere near the buy price that I would buy it. So um, I'll give you an example of a few stocks here, but it really, is not meaningful in terms of where I would buy into these positions. So, um, and, and there's not a lot of businesses on there that are probably gonna surprise you. These are all pretty well-known companies, particularly the ones that are sort of on the watch list and nowhere near a current price that I would buy it. These are big, well-known companies that um, I think most value investors would probably buy at the right price. So you're talking things like uh, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Costco, uh, Monster Beverage might be one that's maybe a little bit more out there, but still a huge company. Um, there's a handful of New Zealand businesses on there. So obviously the A2 Milk Company, uh, I keep an eye on New Zealand King Salmon, um, 
There's also a couple of Australian businesses, so Domino's Pizza Enterprises, which I actually did have a small position in in the past when I was just speculating and really didn't have a solid framework. I was actually a shareholder in Domino's Pizza. Um, ARB on the ASX actually is maybe one of the more interesting ones that I keep an eye on. So uh, that's the ARB that make um, you know four-wheel drive accessories and so on. That's been a pretty good compound grower. It's just a bit expensive and I've never been able to kind of justify building a position in ARB. Um, but there's a handful for you. Hopefully that gives you um, a little bit of an answer to that question and maybe I'll do a full video on that in, in future. So thank you for your question. Okay, and it looks like I'm probably not gonna be able to get through all the questions here. So um, if I skip your question about now, I, I apologize, but I'm gonna try and jump around and try and pick out uh, a few of the, the really interesting ones. So uh, not that your other questions aren't interesting, but uh, you know, we'll try to pick out uh, some, some, some of the best questions here. So, okay, so with that said, next question is from Ishan Chaudhry1. Uh, apologies if I'm butchering your name. Hi Tom, big fan. I just wanted to ask how you managed to keep your emotions in check and also I think that's meant to say what do you think about the intrinsic value formula. Intrinsic value equals EPS times uh, 2 times growth rate plus the PE where G is the expected rate of return. So yeah, so I don't really have any real comment on, on your formula that you've got there other than to say um, that's not the formula I use and I use a discounted cash flow. Um, there are other businesses where a discounted cash flow is really not probably the best way to go about things. So if you're looking at a, you know, a beaten down real estate company like Heritage Growth Properties, for example, uh, which I did a live stream on with Brad Kellner last year, that was an approach where we did more of a liquidation value, um, you know, type approach to that particular investment where um, Brad especially went through every single property and basically, um, you know, got comps on comparable properties and tried to value each of those individual properties. So uh, that's not really something you can do with a simple formula and that's kind of the way that I think about about valuation so that's that part um, the other part of your question is how do you keep your emotions in check um, really it probably just goes back to the punch card investing framework and trying to find one to two good investment ideas per year um, for me that is probably one of the most powerful things I've implemented in my personal investment strategy if I can um, really just pull myself back for a second and say all I need to do is find one or two of these things a year. It takes a huge amount of pressure off in terms of trying to, you know, feeling like you have to be active every single week and so on. It's just, um, you know, if you can take a couple of those things off a year, then you're done, right? So if you can implement that framework, it means that you really don't have to get all emotional about short-term movements and wonder about whether you should be buying or selling. Uh, the only reason you should be selling is if the price gets, you know, really, really high, you were wrong in your investment thesis, and I've done a couple of videos on that topic. Um, and really, you should only be buying if it meets all of your investment criteria and the price is extremely attractive. So, um, again, that's a good way to keep my emotions in check. If I, you know, if it's not super attractive, or if it's not super overvalued, or I was, you know, wrong about the investment, in which case I'd be thinking about selling. Um, if neither of those two things have been met, I just don't have to do anything. And that, that's a nice, simple way to, to keep you from being too emotional on the stock market. Okay, question from Matt is, have you considered options trading in conjunction with your investment strategy? I know Filltown uses them to a reduced basis. Yeah, so I think Filltown's strategy is kind of interesting. Um, I don't have particularly easy options, easy uh, access to options, I should say, here in New Zealand. So uh, it's not something I've ever done. Certainly, if I was gonna implement a strategy like that, I wouldn't be going out and just buying call options or buying put options. Uh, Filltown, like you've sort of um, suggested here, is kind of, on the other side of those transactions generally. So one of the things he does is sells put options, for example, which means that if a stock goes down to a price at which he would buy it, um, those put option contracts sort of um, kick in and he has to buy those stocks at a price that he would be buying them anyway. And if the price doesn't go down, then he sort of collects a premium on those contracts. So that's a framework that I actually quite like. I, I like the, the philosophy of that, but it's never something I've actually, um, I guess, had sufficient access to, to try and implement. So um, thank you for your question there, Matt. Uh, next question is from Steph Grobin. Uh, again, apologies if I'm butchering your name. What caused the decline of A2 Milk Company last Friday? Um, yeah, so again, I don't pay too much attention to short-term price movements, but I did touch on A2 Milk in the recent Punch Card Investing live stream. So if you go and check out the latest episode, which was on the 
uh, our favorite investors was sort of the topic of, of that live stream. Uh, in the last probably 10 or 15 minutes, you should see me answer a question about A2 Milk before I go through this. So um, in terms of what happened with the price last week, I know Sinlay, which is uh, one of the certainly major partners of the A2 Milk company, has had some uh, big news with their management team. So I would do a quick Google search on uh, Sinlay CEO, and uh, that should give you sort of the, the background on what happened there. Um, and I give my sort of my thoughts on the A2 Milk business in that um, in that live stream. So feel free to go and go and check that one out. Uh, investing with Frank, who always asks the tough questions. <laughs> if you were at the Berkshire annual meeting this weekend, what would you ask? Um, I honestly don't know at this point. Like I, I feel like I've gotten inside Warren Buffett's brain and Charlie Munger's brain so much over the years. Um, you know, just with all the information that they've given away, and I really feel like I don't have that many questions. Uh, that many questions left. So it's it's pretty hard for me to, um, you know, actually think of a question around investing specifically. Perhaps I'd be one of those people that asks a question more about life and uh, in general. Maybe I'd ask him about how um, he would get started as a young investor today. Probably something along those lines. I think would would be kind of interesting. I don't think I'd be up there asking him about you know what's his view on macroeconomics or what's his view on current valuations in the stock market or what's his view on uh, you know, how to calculate an intrinsic value or anything like that. I don't think I'd be asking any of those types of questions. I'd probably um, be looking for a more general answer on you know, if he was 20 years old today or 25 years old today and had the same passion for investing as he did when he was 25 years old um, and wanted to you know, go out and do his own thing, how he would perhaps approach that, which in a lot of ways I feel like I might know the answer to that already, which is um, build up a good track record and um, you know, people will swim across shark infested waters to give you money is probably what he would say to that question, but um, I'd like maybe a bit of an updated answer on that if, if he does have one. So um, there you go. Um, Let's do this last question from uh, Alex Court, Financial Future Guide. Uh, do you take exchange risk into considerations when making your investment decisions? Given you're predominantly investing in the US market, much like myself, the majority of your portfolio will be in US dollars. Keep up the good work, mate. Yes, yeah, so that is a good question. So um, this is something that bit for me a little bit last year. So again, I had a pretty phenomenal year last year, even with what I'm about to say kind of uh, factored in. And uh, basically what happened last year is the exchange rate between the US dollar and the New Zealand dollar went against me by about 10%. So um, you know, if I had a 50% return last year, for example, I really only got a 40% return in New Zealand dollars because I had that exchange rate fluctuation. So um, it's not something I really think about. Uh, over the long term, I will be continuing to buy Australian dollars and US dollars and perhaps even Japanese yen or some other currencies. Uh, and I think if you're right on the business, then uh, you know, you should come out the other side okay. And again, I'm sort of going to be dollar cost averaging essentially over time into those different currencies. So I try not to think about it too much. One thing I know for certain is that the New Zealand dollar will get weaker over time. Uh, the purchasing power of those do those dollars will go down, you know, as a result of inflation over a long period of time. Uh, and the same thing will happen with the Australian dollar and the US dollar and probably every other currency in the world uh, with perhaps just a couple of exceptions. Uh, but really, which one depreciates at a faster rate is anyone's guess in my book and not something that I really spend too much time, time trying to predict. So there will be some years where the exchange rate moves against me like it did, you know, in the past um, 12 months. There will be some years when the exchange rate moves in my favor and, you know, it makes my returns look even better than just the US dollar stock price change and so on. So I don't spend too much time thinking about it. It, it would probably be more of an issue if you were... Um, you know, going to be putting a big lump sum into another currency and that's the only time that you ever sort of had that exchange rate transaction. But for me, as someone who's consistently buying, I think I'll average out to, you know, the average exchange rate over time. Uh, and the other thing I do is I sort of keep um, some Australian dollars and some US dollars um, in different brokerage accounts as well. And then I earn my everyday income in New Zealand dollars. So I have some money, sort of a uh, baseline level of cash in each of those three currencies kind of ready to go if something significant does happen in the market. Uh, and outside of that, I'm sort of just um, continually contributing to those currencies as I need to. So that's it for today and thank you for everyone that asked a question. I apologize if I didn't get a chance to get to your particular question if you did ask one. Um, but thank you to everyone who did ask a question. I obviously can't do these videos without you uh, and I wouldn't be doing these videos if you weren't watching as well. So I appreciate the support on the channel. That is it from me for this one and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.